excited, guys. Good morning. Come on in. We're going to grab a seat and get started. This morning's going to be a little different or quite a bit different from what we've done before. So get a seat. We're going to jump in. As you're getting started, we're going to play something here you can watch. We're going to do a little recap of our Project Man Card. It was the first ever uh, cycle we've kicked off. We're hoping, by God's grace, to do dozens, if not hundreds, more of these. Wanted to give you a little taste and flavor of what it was like. Many of you were praying, if not all of you were praying for the boys and for the dads. If you're new to Grace City, welcome. Uh, I'm Josh. Buckle up. We go fast around here. So uh, you got a lot of catching up to do. This is a quick little recap of the weekend to give you a little taste and flavor. If pictures are worth a thousand's word, this is about a library worth of information for you. And then we'll jump in with some testimonies afterwards. Sound good? Merry Christmas. Stand up real quick. We'll do this. Stand up. Give the guy next to you a hug. Tell him Merry Christmas. Okay, now turn to the other guy. Big masculine hug. I mean, make, make sure, here you go, that's good, okay. Okay, that's good. Okay, now sit down, that's good. The key to a good masculine hug is a slap that stings, right? If it hurts a little bit, then it doesn't feel effeminate and weird. So you gotta make it hurt just a little bit, and then you're good, amen? Amen, all right, let's check this out, a little recap of the weekend here.
Project Man Hard. I and your dad honor you and congratulate you on completing your course. Man, is there anything more sweeter than dads with their boys? You know, I don't care who you are. If you if uh, you can watch that and get through it out of dry eye, it's something's not right in your heart, right? It's like there's something right about dads pouring the lives of their sons. I want to invite a few of the dads I'm going to get share a testimony this morning. So Jacob and Kyle and Glenn and was it Aaron? Maybe I can't think. Uh, Aaron, yeah, why don't you get, you come on up and you can grab the mics there. And uh, what we wanted to do this morning was just kind of give you a glimpse and a window into that weekend. Again, uh, if you're new to Grace City or new to Stronger Men Nation, uh, we take uh, our role as men very seriously. And a part of that job is not only be good men and becoming better men every day ourselves, it's to raise up the next generation of better men to turn the tide of evil that's washing over our country right now. Amen. And uh, if the battle is going to get won, the tide's going to get turned, and the culture is going to be changed, 
it, it takes us doing our job, and it takes us raising up an army of men coming behind us. And so what you just saw, Project Mancart, Saka 1, we're praying by God's grace becomes, I mean, you know, a global movement. I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't want to dream too big, but hey, why not? Uh, and, and God's done big things in small towns before. Amen? Yeah, I remember hearing a story about, about a baby coming to a small town and something about a global movement sparked after that. And so uh, it'd be just like Jesus to use a, a dude in a pear orchard from Monitor and a bunch of guys from a little town called Wenatchee and no one's ever heard about to spark another global movement. I'd be totally fine with that. You know, I'd, I'd be down with that. I don't know if you're okay with that or not. Maybe you're not awake this morning. Anybody okay, be okay with that? Would you be okay with that? That'd be okay? I think we'd be okay with that. So, uh, and so the heart and the, and the dream is, is uh, that we could um, start doing this on a regular basis. Um, if your dad here with a son, uh, we already have a, a waiting list uh, for the next Project Man card. Uh, we had more guys sign up the first time than we had room for. This, this space is limited due to kind of the, the, the programming of the weekend. Uh, we can only do about 20 boys uh, and dads at a time. So we got a list already started. If you'd like to put your name on that list, uh, Justin Kissel will have a list out in the junction when you leave. Uh, we're hoping to get one. Uh, this winter or spring, depending on how the weather uh, cooperates, and then another couple this summer. Uh, but, but it's our prayer that, w- that we could be doing dozens of these a year. That's going to take property, and it's going to take staff. So I'm not even joking. If you're here and got 1,000 acres, come talk to me afterwards. Like, we'd love for you to give it to the church. Uh, we don't have money to buy it. I'm just going to be honest. But like, we don't. So, so uh, just, just put all our cards on the table, and you bring your cards to the table, and we'll see what God can do. Um, but if we're going to do this on a regular basis, we'd, we'd need some property. Doing a pop-up man car project on a buddy's property uh, is, is fun, but not sustainable for the next 15, 20 years. So we got lots of infrastructure to put in place before this can become, the dream becomes a reality, but we're going to keep taking steps for it as the Lord leads. So we've got a couple more planned, hopefully two or three planned for 23, and then on from there. But wanted you men to kind of get a taste and flavor of it, um, because we're serious about, about building stronger men, and, and uh, we think it starts uh, with the fathers and the sons in the home. And that's what this rite of passage uh, uh, process is about. So if you've got boys at home that are 6, 8, 10, 11, 12, well, uh, you keep putting fire uh, on this little campfire, and it'll be a bonfire by the time your boys get there. It'll, it'll be rocking. So what I wanted to do is just kind of give you a window into the experience by r- rather than me telling you about it, because you hear me yap all the time, is here from, um, yeah, four dads uh, who were there with their, with their boys. At the end of that, uh, I'm going to bring up a really special guest to share a closing story, and then my boy uh, and one of his best buddies is going to take us home. So that's the totality of the morning, um, and we should get, out, get you out here a little early. <laughs> Probably not, but um, but I said that to give some of you hope that are that are new. So, okay, uh, Jacob, come up here, buddy. Want you to welcome Jacob Morgan here, everybody. Come on, <laughs> buddy. All right. So, Jacob, uh, I asked these guys to give me a big big takeaway observation of the weekend uh, that they observed, something they took away in their own heart or life with their sons. So, I got no idea what you guys are going to share. So, bless me. All right. <laughs> We'll try. <laughs> Tell us real quick uh, uh, where you work here in town. So uh, I'm a business manager for Generation Transmission at Chelan PUD. Awesome. And your boy? Uh, Riley Morgan. Riley Morgan. How old is Riley? 16. Yep. 16 uh, Freight Train. Freight Train. Freight Train Morgan. That's yeah. right. All the boys got a nickname. Uh, well earned, each one. Just talk to Walker Young about that name. That's right. Ask yeah. Walker Young about Riley Morgan. He'll remember the Freight Train. So step up here. And uh, what do you got? So... Uh, um, a couple we we talked again this morning coming in i think a, a couple of things that really just stuck out to me is um w- we don't do stuff like this like what you saw in that video that's not uh we've i've done very controlled uh type of events so this for me as we're leaving and departing i'm worried about my wife and then i get there and i realize i've got a problem yeah you are your wife <laughs> 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 yeah, totally. I'm gonna let go, and uh, and he was okay talking to us. Uh, we we happen to be uh, criers uh, when we get adrenaline spikes and dumps. Instead of uh, our outlet ends up being tears. So we hit the water. Well, sorry, we didn't. The boys yeah, hit the water. Yeah, it was almost like we did it, wasn't yeah, it? Well, it <laughs> felt cold in our five it, layers on the shore. It looked cold from where but, I was standing. Uh, yeah, and uh, he came out, and I get my arms around him, and my boy's crying, and. Uh, and so I, I, I talked to Josh on the walk back. I'm like, I broke my kid. Uh, <laughs> what am I doing here? 
And I, I, I literally was in this place of like, I need somebody to talk life into my boy because I, I really did think at that moment uh, that I did wrong by bringing him there. Yeah. And, uh, and then we get to the next day and I just watch him, just the joy in his face with these men pouring into him and learning stuff. And, and what I come to realize very quickly is he's all in. Like he's locked and loaded, ready to go. And dad's got to work through some stuff and just let go of his boy. Yeah. Um, and so, so that weekend becomes one yeah, of the, come on. <laughs> so as much as I thought this weekend was for my boy, I learned a lot about what the Lord had to teach me in the, the weekend as a father and, and to trust in that preparation and the men I've had around me over the last few years since we've moved here and just trust in that preparation into that weekend. Yeah. Um, and then just really on the flip side, I remember sitting on the the bank, you saw the photo of the dads up top waiting to receive our boys coming in. And I was there with uh, Eric Chase and um, OG um, Greg uh, McPherson. And um, we were talking, and uh, the comment kind of came up about, the man, the boys still have a lot left in their tank. I think we could have pushed them a little bit more. And, uh, and what really the Lord just kind of put on my heart was what, we, what was happening this weekend was a different product that you might see um, in a military environment or something else where it's about tearing down their identity and then giving them a new government nameplate identity. And this was about, we already knew their identity in Christ. And so everywhere these boys went, there was men that they could trust that were giving wise counsel and encouraging them on. So what you saw is that when the boys' tanks were empty, there was somebody spurring them on and pushing them forward into that next activity, that next event. And so they had, they could not have energy. They could not have the tank. And we knew that we burned their tank when I think all of them either got sick or slept for 12 hours after the event. So Or 48. 48, yeah. <laughs> so um, it was just really cool to watch that dynamic. And, and it just really paralleled to the walk that I wish for my boy and myself of just having when, when things hit the fan, when, toughest, when, when things are hard and you want to quit, you want to mail it in, you've got men along the way just right there with you, yep. encouraging yep. you and pushing you. And, and just taking you forward. So yep. it's cool to watch. Last piece I'll get, I asked my son, I said, what was your takeaway? He said, uh, Pastor Josh has really encouraged and pushed this concept of real conversations. Um, he said his favorite part was the campfire with those five boys, four other boys, and just having real conversation. Um, he plays football, spends a lot of time in the locker room, and uh, he said those aren't real conversations. Yeah. That's not real men, manhood. Um, and so to, to experience that with other young men, to actually go deep beyond the surface, really just changed this whole perspective on what it means to have relationships with other men yep. and, and what it could be and what that potential is. So. That's awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Jacob. Woo! Isn't that good? Yeah. <laughs> Morning, Kyle. Morning. Lay it on us, buddy. What do you got? Introduce yourself. Yeah, Kyle Strong. I'm actually one of the pastors here at Grace City Church. I look like a guy who changes tires at Les Schwab, I know. But, <laughs> hey, that's a noble profession, by the way. It is a noble profession. <laughs> yep. <laughs> we have one right there. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of, yeah. I mean, yeah, he'd like to see you do it for a day. I know. Uh, <laughs> it'd be funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wrong. Speaking of man car project, yeah, that's right. let's take Kyle Strong down to Les Schwab for six hours, see how he does. Yeah, video that. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Speaking of getting sick and sleeping for a day, <laughs> you and I'd be both whooped. Oh, man. Okay, what do you got? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's it, um, top top five moment for me personally, outside of, you know, Jesus saving me, marrying my wife, the birth of my three boys. It was, I, I'm still finding difficulty, still having difficulty finding the words to articulate and express. I was journaling about it last night. You know, and it's, 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 uh, that's evidence of, of just the kind of grace that our Heavenly Father bestows upon you, you know, when you think back to your salvation moments or those, or those peak moments in your life and in your walk with God, where you're like, I, I mean, it's incredible, yeah. but outside of that, words just can't do it justice. And so, um, you, you know, walking away from that weekend was just like, we have a really, I have a really, really you guys have a really, really, we have a really, really awesome, good Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. He's just incredible. Mm -hmm. He's just incredible mm -hmm. to, to surround, particularly with my story. This was everything that I did not have growing up, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you walk through it, and I get to see, learn so much about my boy, mm -hmm. so much about my boy. And I'm telling you, dads, 
uh, you don't know really what your sons can do, right? And that, that was the beauty of, of this moment is I think my sons are, and Maddox and specifically for, for Project Mancard, are capable of anything. I think they're incredibly competent, incredibly capable, incredibly spirit-filled boys and young men, and yet I walk away from that weekend, I'm like, dude, I'm holding them back. I, I, I gotta create more opportunities, more experiences, because I just haven't tested them enough yet, which is awesome. That's a wonderful, that's a wonderful joy to have. Um, but as I stood up upon Heartbreak Hill, which is where all those dads lined, the top of the hill and then the instructors lined, and, and that was a, it, it's a big hill, it, pictures don't do it justice, and it's a steeper hill, is, uh, it was just like, man, I have such an incredible Heavenly Father to surround me with such incredible men. There's no way I could have ever done something like this to experience the joy of the brotherhood of those who, who are uh, walking with Jesus faithfully. It's God's grace to me, and by extension, then it's God's grace to my son, right? Mm -hmm. And he gets to benefit from the hard work, the faithfulness of all of those dads, Pastor Josh, Pastor Adam, the men that I get to be surrounded by. And so, uh, it, the, the body of Christ is, an, is, is a really, really powerful thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, to lock arms with, with those kinds of men and, uh, and, and live a life worth living for the king. Oh, man, blessing upon blessing, right? Mm -hmm. And so learned a lot about my boy. He could do anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, he was, I've, I've asked him, like, were you nervous about the river crossing? He's like, yeah. I'm, I mean, he had like a healthy anxiety for, for everything, but it was like, okay, I got to put more in front of him because he's just a stalwart. He'll just go. And, uh, and that's really encouraging, right? Yeah. Obviously, as a dad, yeah. and he'll be a pillar. He'll be a pillar in his home. He'll be a pillar in his church. He'll be a pillar in his community. And, uh, and I'm just getting more and more a taste for that. So it walked away here. Here's la last, last takeaway is like, I've never loved being a dad more. Mm. Never loved being a dad more, yeah. and I've loved being a dad. Yeah. But I've never loved being a dad more. Yeah. To to just get a a a foretaste, um, almost look to the future of what kind of man my son will be. <laughs> Dude, that's exciting. Absolutely, super exciting. So, yeah. still still processing, but oh my goodness, alive. Yeah, an incredible heavenly father we have. Yeah. You know, surrounded by an incredible group of men who uh, who care enough about my son to take the time, I'm thinking of Justin Kissel, obviously Pastor Josh, who have taken, and all the instructors there, who didn't even have kids there, and didn't have boys there, and people really love me, because God really loves me. It's Amen. incredible, so. Yeah, that's good stuff, thanks Kyle. Yeah. Oh, you can go to Aaron there. <laughs> Aaron. <Amen. laughs> Introduce yourself, what you do, and uh, a little takeaway. Yeah, you bet, good morning guys. Uh, my name is Aaron Anderson. Uh, I'm Regional Director for Johnson & Johnson. I don't look like I work for Johnson & Johnson, <laughs> but I work for Johnson & Johnson here uh, in Wenatchee, and I manage uh, a lot of our sales reps in the Northwest. Um, three boys, Callan is going to be 16 next week, Gunner is 14, and SJ is 10. So I had the privilege of taking the two older ones on this journey, uh, which was absolutely fantastic. So tell us how you got to Gray City. Yeah, good that, question. That's kind of a cool story. Yeah, so with the industry I'm in, the job that I do, we've moved uh, quite a bit in the last 10 years. Uh, I think the boys have been in five or six schools. I've already mentioned their age, so you can do the math. It's about every other year uh, that we've moved or so. And um, <clears throat> when we lived in Wenatchee from 2010 to 2013, um, we had started going to Grace City Church back when it was in the SDA building. Um, in uh, I think late 2012 and uh, my wife and I just kind of had a light bulb moment of going wow this is a solid church this is where we want to raise our family this is where we want the boys to grow up and establish relationships and friendships and we wanted that for ourselves as well <laughs> well we moved we moved down to the Tri-Cities uh, for my job and we spent four years down there from 2013 to 2017 the Tri-Cities uh, you know it's a desert it's a it's a not a very beautiful area, and we love the outdoors. And there's not a lot of outdoors stuff there, and uh, but the job was good. It was a good job, and and the boys were growing, and we were plugged into a church. Um, but it was a desert season for us spiritually as well, and uh, we um, 
knew what we wanted as far as a culture and a tribe and an environment to uh, walk with the Lord in for our boys to grow up in, and that didn't exist down there. And um, when uh, the company asked me to take the current job that I have right now, uh, it was a remote position. And so we started kind of dreaming a little bit about, well, should we move out of the Tri-Cities? Yes. <laughs> it, was, it was quick. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and Lord, where do you want us to go? And we had some really good friends at that time that were um, uh, members of Grace City Church that would come down and visit us, and we'd come up and visit them, and then we'd come and visit church, and we'd be like, oh, this is what we're missing. And, you know, we knew Josh had a heart, and, we, you know, talking to Pastor Adam had a heart for young men and raising up a generation, um, because things, things are looking... Things are looking bleak if you guys haven't picked up from your computers lately. Um, and so we need, we need young men that are going to follow the Lord and going to lead their families and lead their communities, as Kyle talked about, looking forward to having his son as a pillar in the community. So we prayed about it when we were down in the Tri-Cities, and we felt like the Lord was telling us to move back to Wenatchee. And it was exciting. We, we got our whiteboard out, and we listed the pros and the cons of staying in Kennewick versus moving to Wenatchee. And my wife and I looked at each other with kind of the, the daunting, like, oh, let's call the movers one more time. Here we go. We're going to move again. So we moved back to Wenatchee, and um, it was five years ago, uh, two weeks ago. It was Thanksgiving uh, weekend five years ago. And my goodness, you guys, um, everything that we thought we knew that existed uh, for our boys to grow up in with having good, solid friends of their own, good households when I know they want to go hang out with their buddies without worrying about what the mom and dad are talking about, what they're looking at on TV, what the dad's got laying around. Um, that doesn't exist here. And I'm proud that I can raise my boys and that Nikki and I can thrive in this church. You know, little did I know in the Tri-Cities, Nikki, my wife, was praying for me that I could be surrounded by a group of strong dudes. Mm -hmm. Because she knew it was hard for me. She knew I lacked that community of good, godly guys to get around, to grow with, to adventure with, to have fun with. And um, the Lord has been so kind in just rewarding our faithfulness when we felt he called us to move back here. Because, guys, I'm telling you what, what exists here is really, really rare. It doesn't exist a lot of places. I mean, I see a lot of dads with a lot of kids that are probably a few years away from doing this. And guys, I'm telling you, get excited. Because this was one event, and it was a life-changing event for me as a dad, watching my boys do things that I didn't know if they were capable of doing them, watching them rappel off of a 40-foot cliff, watching them cross a river as ice chunks were floating by and up to their nipples. That was cold. <laughs> it was really cold, and I was proud of them. But that was one thing. The thing that exists all the time here is the culture mm -hmm. of strong men that love the Lord, mm -hmm. that are raising their families that's right, right. Come on. that are loving their wives, that are loving their kids. And that's evident by the more dudes I meet here, the more guys I'm in community and having conversations with. And it's exciting because when I see little guys walking around, yeah. I'm like, oh boy, here it comes. they don't even know. That's right. They don't that's even it. know how good they have it yeah. here, and they don't even know what's in store for them as they're walking towards noble manhood yep. from a biblical perspective. Yep. This was super special. And I, man, I cannot thank you enough <laughs> for your vision and your fortitude for putting yeah, this buddy. together. Yeah, buddy. It's important. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. 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 I love you. Um, so guys, I want, I want to leave you with this. Um, culture is everything with your kids, specifically young men. Man, there is a war being waged against your kids. Get them in the right stream. Get them with the right tribe and the right community. Not so that we can just huddle up and be just ourselves in an inbred church, so we can go out and be stronger together out in the world that needs this, that needs this today more than they ever have. Um, so I thank you guys for all your prayers and all your support yeah. as these young men were up there doing this. But we're just getting started, man. That's right. And that is really, really cool. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, thank buddy. you, Aaron. I love you, buddy. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Come on out, Glenn. Glenn, give us your name and, and uh, give us a takeaway or part of your story I think you yeah. want to share. Yeah. So good morning. My name is Glenn Carlson. Um, uh, we recently moved to the Valley, uh, gosh, February of this year. So we were pretty much, I think we were the newest family up there. 
Um, I'm married with a little girl who's eight, Ingrid, and my two boys, uh, Eric and Johan. Uh, Grit and Gunny um, were their nicknames, That's so it was right. a lot of fun. His uh, oldest boy started the hike with two massive blisters on his foot yeah. and did the whole man car journey with blisters, and his buddies didn't even know about it. So he, he, he earned the name Grit. What a stud. Yeah, he, no, he was, he was impressive for sure. Uh, quick background, uh, we moved over from the, the west side. Um, I work from home, and so we had the opportunity to move uh, wherever we wanted. We had the great place in Snohomish, a uh, little gen gentleman's farm, uh, mortgage percentage. It was super low. Um, oh my gosh, it was so low. And, um, and then tell us how low. Yes. Yeah, my wife. My wife went to Idaho to visit a friend. She said, "Wow, I loved Idaho." And we're like, "Oh, maybe we should move." So we started looking at Idaho, Montana, Tennessee. Is the you know a ton of what so many people have done. Um, realized that uh, what we had in Snohomish, after a lot of just events that had happened, is we really didn't have community. Um, and so we were faced with a decision, do we uh, go forward and try to kind of rebuild community there? Or, you know, what are we going to do? And so looking at, at Idaho, Montana, and then we never really considered Wenatchee. Uh, my wife grew up in Leavenworth, actually has known the McPherson family her whole life. Um, uh, my sister-in-law used to babysit you, apparently. She did. Uh, yeah, did, so yeah. back in the day. And His sister-in-law was the first Maria in the Leavenworth Sound of Music. True story. Yep. Isn't that amazing? Oh, yeah. I thought it was. Okay, anyways. <laughs> Carry on, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, long story short, we, uh, we decided to move back to, to, to Wenatchee primarily because we were moving towards community. We had been w watching Grace City Online, and um, for me personally as a man, um, you know, Grace City uh, and what you've done and Adam and just the whole crew, um, I felt like I could come under authority mm. with this group of men. Mm. And um, it's pretty rare, pretty rare to be able to say that about somebody. Mm -hmm. um, so we made the move in February, and um, it's been great. It's been great for us. Mm -hmm. So, um, man card. So um, my takeaways, my main takeaway was just this concept of legacy and watching the McPhersons and what your grandpa did mm -hmm. and your dad and your uncle and you and your brother and how a legacy can touch a family a thousand families in a whole valley and the whole country was really, really um, important for me. It was really my big takeaway. Number one, because I had all these amazing instructors who were pouring into my kids and literally a once in a lifetime opportunity um, this weekend was, was amazing. I knew my boys were capable of it, but now they know that they're capable of it. And that, that's, that's, a, that's a huge takeaway. Yeah. So number one, the instructors. Number two, I was surrounded by really good company. The dads, um, every dad that I met was just a quality, quality person. Um, I had a chance to meet a guy named Josh Carlson, um, which many of you know, um, but he has been working with my boys in the leadership team uh, at youth group talking about men and talking about identity and, and all kinds of things. And so, you know, as a dad, you're like, so what'd you guys learn? He goes, oh, we were over at Carlson's house learning about identity. I'm like, okay. What's, what is that about? So you start talking to them and you start hearing what they're saying. You're like, thank you, God, yeah, that that's right. there's a community of men that are yep. willing to pour into my kids and that's have right. conversations that I'm not having, yep. or at least not at the depth as somebody yep. else is having. Um, and I think um, just the third takeaway for me was personally just the charge to step up, to mm -hmm. remember to continue to grind and be part of a, um, to be a stronger man. Yep. And as cliche as it sounds, I actually say it in my head, would a stronger man do that? Yeah. And I do that. Like, yeah. it's crazy. Like, take a second glance at a girl. A stronger man wouldn't do that. That's right. I got to dig deep. A strong yeah. man would do that. And yep. this community that's here, kind of like what Aaron was saying, it's just been such a blessing to us and our family. And we're in such a better place today than we were a year ago. Yep. And so thank you. And just thank you to the Stronger Man Nation for embracing us and yep. uh, giving us the opportunity to jump into community, yep. and it's been amazing. So yeah, awesome. Yeah, thank you, Glenn. Right. God bless you, buddy. Thank you, yep. thank you for sharing. I got it. <clears throat> so, I'm going to invite Mr. Foreman to come up and close us with a story. But uh, there's so much more we could go into, and as each guy shares, so many stories rise to service. But uh, there's a lot more in Glenn's story. But and there's a lot more men like Glenn who have been in a dry place, away from here, have seen what God's doing, and. Guys, they're moving their families here. 
They're uprooting their, their jobs and their homes and their families to move here to be a part of what you men are, are, are stirring, what you men are cultivating. And so you may think, well, I don't have sons or I didn't get to go to, the, to Project Man Carter. Like, that doesn't matter. Who you are as a man and what you do and how you live is creating a culture that other people are noticing. Okay? So, so every man in here has a role and responsibility to do their job where they're at as God leads. And that's a part of this larger move of God. I think about Mr. Cranwell standing back there. Now, he didn't go to Project Mancart, and, and he doesn't have a, a boy who's young. His boy's off grown and serving in the military. But he's a godly man who's leading his home, who's investing his time and his life into this community. He serves anchored uh, as he's able, although I heard Link Bus is trying to kill him recently, so he hasn't had a lot of time in the last few months. But he's being a godly man in his home. He's, he's, he's doing his job. And then his wife steps up here on Monday and blessed 568 women who were here. And I think if your wife came back and told you the story that she shared, you know how deeply it impacted her. So can we tell uh, Gary back here, thank you for being a godly man. Good job, Gary, leading your wife. It's incredible. <clears throat> so uh, I, 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 want, I want to do this to close this. I want to introduce one of our instructors, uh, Clyde Foreman. He can introduce himself and what he did for a living. We had uh, 16 instructors up there, uh, uh, some in law enforcement, some from military, some from just all walks of life. And they left it on the field investing in these young men. And we've been talking ever since and dreaming about how we can grow this. And these are a group of men who have been uh, uh, trained in different sets of skills and have the gift set uh, uh, as a teacher and instructor. And uh, I'm not committing them to the future, but as far as I can tell, they're all in for as many of these as we can figure out how to schedule. And it gets a, they get excited about thinking how to invest into your boys and into our boys and into this community. Because, uh, again, I'll say it again if you're new here, we take very seriously two things, being good men and raising better men. Like, that's a big deal to us. It's not just about raising better men and coasting ourselves. We want to first be good men and call those young boys to follow us. And so I think we're on the front end of something very, very special. There's lots more coming that I want to share with you in the days to come. We'll get to that at the beginning of the year. Uh, Pastor Adam is, is, is uh, developing a pretty uh, special uh, uh, tool and weapon for us to use. We're, we're going to unpack that for you first of the year. We'll let you get through the holiday crazies and then get back after it. But to close our time, I ask uh, Mr. Foreman to share a story. He kind of kicked off um, our, our uh, man card project. Project Man Card with Friday night or Thursday night after they went through their initiation, which was to cross the Inuit River at about nine o'clock at night. I think it was about 17 degrees. Uh, and they uh, crossed the river and came back and then had to hump it back up to the camp and get dry by the fire. And while they were drying and warming by the fire, Mr. Foreman told this story. And I thought it was apropos for our time this morning. So you welcome uh, Clyde Foreman. <laughs> Thanks, <Clyde. laughs> Well, before I tell the story, I just want to say on behalf of all the instructors, what an honor it was for us to get to participate in the Man Card event and to uh, share with these young men and the dads uh, some of the, our life experiences. It really was an honor. Yeah, um, yeah, it, was, it was fantastic. I would have paid to have been there. It was great. Um, we can totally arrange that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a old retired guy now. In my younger life, I spent 35 years in law enforcement, most of that with the FBI. I was a supervisory special agent in San Francisco. I had uh, three programs I was responsible for, our SWAT program, our special operations group, which was our surveillance teams. We have ground teams, aviation assets. I had uh, 12 agents that worked for me on the ground, another six full-time pilots and 12 part-time pilots, and we were a national asset. Uh, we followed bad guys all around the United States. One day it might be a bank robber, next day a, uh, a general in the KGB, uh, uh, drug dealers, uh, terrorists, and we did all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, when I retired from law enforcement, I went to work in corporate security for uh, the Tesoro Refining Corporation, which was later bought out by Marathon Petroleum. Uh, I'm retired, living here now. Um, one of my jobs in the FBI, I worked in our police training unit in San Francisco. We provided training to over 200 local law enforcement agencies in California. Police department, sheriff's offices, fish and game, uh, did a, a variety of different things. And one of the courses that we taught was an officer's survival school. And it was not only the ability tactically to survive an armed encounter, but how to survive mentally afterwards. 
And one of the uh, gentlemen that we got to know and, uh, and share part of his story with these police officers was Captain Charlie Plum, a United States Naval Aviator who received a presidential appointment to attend Annapolis where he graduated and then later went to Pensacola, got his wings and flew F-4 Phantom Bs off the USS Kitty Hawk and had 85 missions over North Vietnam. Um, on his 85th mission, this was five days before he was to leave the carrier, fly to Hawaii, meet his family, go back stateside, assume his career on the mainland out of harm's way. His aircraft was hit by a SAM-2 surface-to-air missile. It disintegrated midair, and he had about 90 seconds to think as he floated down in his parachute down into North Vietnam. And he said he said a, a very quick prayer, asked the Lord to protect him, and you can imagine uh, what it was like. Well, maybe we can't imagine, but he, he'd been trained to escape an evasion, but he was captured almost immediately. He was tortured by the North Vietnamese and incarcerated at the Hanoi Hilton prison for over five years. Hmm. And every day, he, uh, the torture was relentless. He had both shoulders dislocated, bones broken. And his experience was similar to most of the captives in that prison. One of the young men that he met in that prison was a, a, a Navy seaman by the name of Doug Hegdell. And uh, you, here's the prison population. It's all officers, it's all pilots. And here's this Navy seaman. And uh, you know what was he doing there in this prison? Well, uh, Captain Plum said they would, in their spare time, talk about how fast were you flying, how high were you flying when you were shot down, and the high fast was 50,000 feet at over 500 miles an hour. The slow low was 25 feet at 12 knots, and that was Doug Hegdell falling off the side of a, his ship in the middle of the uh, ocean, and he was later captured by the North Vietnamese. Uh, Doug Hegdell, uh, was from the South, had kind of a Southern accent, and he played the dummy. And the Vietnamese quickly just ignored him, and little did they know, he had a photographic memory, and he had the ability to get anywhere in the prison system, and Charlie Plum was the chaplain for all those guys. And uh, Doug Hegdell, in the course of five years, memorized the name of every soldier sailor airman that was in that prison, their phone number and their social security number. And when he was released early, before all of the prisoners were released, he came back to the United States and he drove from city to city and called up families and said, your husband, your son is alive at the Hanoi Hilton. And most, many people in the military had no idea whether these folks had survived or not. Wow. Well, following Charlie's uh, release from the Hanoi Hilton and came back to the United States, he was sitting in a restaurant, and when he came back to the United States, he's been incarcerated for five years in a 15-foot cell, 15 feet long, 15 feet wide, tortured every day, comes home and finds out that while he's been gone, his wife divorced him and left him, hmm. and uh, he has got to deal with some real adversity in his life. And he's sitting at a restaurant, and a young man walks up to him and actually walks by him and comes back and kind of does a double take and goes, you're, you're Charlie Plum. You flew fighters off the USS Kitty Hawk. And Charlie said he was just amazed, had no idea who this guy was. He got up, shook his hand, yes, sir, I'm Charlie Plum. And the young guy says, well, I, I packed your parachute. And Charlie thought, my gosh, how many times did I pass this guy in the US, on the USS Kitty Hawk, had no idea who he was, and he packed my parachute. And he said, when I was floating down over North Vietnam, I thought about who packed my parachute. It was my pastor. It was Sunday school teachers. It was my parents who taught me about the Lord, mm. and that's how I survived. Mm. So I guess the question for all of us this morning is, 
as you reflect on your life for a moment, who packed your parachute? Mm. You know, I've shared with the, the youngsters here that for my life, it was guys like Chuck Swindoll, and uh, it was pastors at our church like Josh who spoke ex from an expository teaching. They taught you the Bible. They prepared you for adversity, and that's what stronger men are all about okay. is the courage to do the right thing and to have that parachute that's been packed. And I guess the last question for all of us this morning, whose parachute are you packing That's or right. helping out? That's right. So anyway, again, a great opportunity to share with the young men here at this church. It was a privilege, and uh, thank you, Josh, for that privilege. Thank you, Kai, very much. I love you. I love you. I love you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Could you listen until that guy tells stories all day? I mean, seriously. Uh, and so thank you, Mr. Foreman. He just, he's just a sampling of the kind of caliber of men we had up there over the weekend investing in the lives of these boys. And uh, just to honor him, he's been a godly man, a stronger man, and he's raised a stronger man. Chris Foreman is chief operations at Shalane County Sheriff's Office. Never more important than now to have godly men there in leadership and is one of my dearest friends. So, Mr. Foreman, thank you for raising uh, one of the dearest friends I have in my life. So very grateful for that. Yep. <laughs> Hopefully what you're seeing is generational legacy and blessing when men come together and get serious about following Jesus. Um, I have not gotten to know Mr. Foreman until in the last few years when they moved here after their retirement retirement, second retirement, or third retirement. And um, the irony is, is, is the opportunity to be able to invest in his son's life as his son's pastor and then having that son invest in my life as one of my dearest friends, then also invest in the life of my son. I have many pictures of his son, Chris Foreman, uh, with my son as Levi was a young man. In fact, um, Chris Foreman gave my son his first challenge coin that led to, to, uh, to me valuing these as well. And so Levi's first uh, a conquering of his fear came um, with the help of Mr. Foreman, your son. So uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be among a tribe of men, amen, who care about being strong men together. And uh, so here's what I want to do. I want to bring uh, Ben and Levi up here to wrap us up. And uh, I, I uh, be ready in season and out, Paul says, young men. So this is uh, that moment when you get called on the spot without any preparation. Uh, I'm going to have you, you can grab, uh, we need two mic. We got two mics up here, Keith. Is there another mic there? There's only one up here. Well, you guys can just share. How about that? Um, will that work? You can come up here. Uh, I, I want to read something to you. We're going to close. Uh, I I'm going to read to you uh, from 2 Timothy chapter 2, and then these boys are going to exhort us. Listen to Paul's exhortation to Timothy. This is the passage of Scripture that, that Pastor Adam has taught on for 20 years when it comes to raising boys. This is the passage that we've drawn on for the four core identities of the Stronger Men nation. And I want, I, want to, I want to pull out two things that bracket this text that we don't normally highlight as much for you to hear before as you go. You then, my son, that's the number one identity, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses in trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach other people. Join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus, for no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similar, similarly, anyone who completes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. Accor uh, similarly, the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive uh, the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. So those are our four identities, the, 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 the soldier, farmer, athlete, son, the protector, the provider, the leader, and the lover of God, the lover of man, the lover of one woman. Verse 8, remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here's what I want us to hear. There's an exhortation there to step into the four primary identities that God's called us to be as men, protectors, uh, we're, we're soldiers of the battle to fight, providers, we're farmers of the field to work and, and a crop to harvest, we're athletes, right, with a race to run and a crown to win, and we're, we're sons. We have a father to please, we've been built to be lovers, lovers of God, lovers of man, lovers of people. You spend your lifetime 
growing in those identities, it'll keep you busy, right? Like, you shouldn't be bored if you're awake to what God's called you to do and who God's called you to be. Sport Mo Vasquez right there. Oh, there's a, there's a name behind that. Woo! In the video with the green smoke when Walker in, in, in the punch suit grabbed that kid and pounded him on the ground, and two seconds later, the kid was on top of him pounding him. Sport Mode Vasquez right there. So <laughs> lots of stories. Don't, don't, let, don't let him uh, fool you over there. He's not a sleeper. He's a, he's a fighter. But bracketing those two core identities, uh, uh, Paul uh, makes these two kind of observations and charges, and, I, and I, don't, I don't want us to miss them. Paul is exhorting them to learn well their role and their call so they can be more equipped to disciple other men in the same thing. He's like, hey, figure this out, because, because one of the ways you become a stronger man is you help other men become stronger men. You live in community, right? You raise up young boys. You do your job. You, you, you get in a group of other men. You push them. You, 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 you encourage them. You let them push you. You let them encourage you. We were not made to live in isolation. One, 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 of, the, one of the expressions of, of masculine masculinity that's broken is, is the lone wolf, isolated, you know, lone ranger dude. We don't do that kind of garbage masculinity. We come together because you were made to be a weapon, but you got a lot of sharp edges that aren't helpful that actually hurt and you get knocked off in the context of male community, right? Your wife's been given to you as your primary helpmate, and God uses her to sanctify you, but she can't rough off all your rough ed- knock off all your rough edges. You need um, iron to sharpen that in the, in the form of other men. And so the, the, the first piece is Paul is saying, figure out how to become a stronger man so you can help other men become stronger. That's one of the primary ways you'll become stronger yourself. And then get a life worth living in that you set your sights on a higher purpose than yourself. Paul brackets the whole thing with figure out how to become a stronger man so you can help other men become stronger men. And oh, by the way, I'm suffering in chains in prison for a purpose that I see that's higher uh, than my safety and comfort. I'm in prison. I'm probably going to die here. And it's been worth every second and everything I've lost because Jesus is glorified, and, and that's worth living for. So get a life of meaning and purpose that's beyond just making a buck, and then help other men become stronger men. That's the exhortation to the stronger man of the church. Amen? So I want you to stand up, and I want you to receive this exhortation from these two young men. You guys step up here to the front. Look all these men in the eye. Um, uh, we gave these men what we call the stronger man creed. And the challenge of these young men was to memorize it. And so uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Keith, if you can find a picture of these guys down the very, very end of the slideshow. This is my son, Levi McPherson, uh, Levi Gregory McPherson, his middle name named after his grandpa. And how old are you, Levi? 16. And this is uh, Ben Jamin James. And uh, he's how old are you, Ben? I am 17. You're 17. He's Adam's son. And so uh, they've been together quite a while. It's right down at the end of the slideshow there, Keith, if you can find it. Find it there? Maybe not. Okay, well, you can't find it? Okay. It's, it's, at, it, it's a picture of them as kids. Well, I mean, younger than they are right now. <laughs> no go? There it is. Okay. So that that is... Uh, Oh, perfect. Levi on the right and uh, uh, Ben Banjo Man on the left. That's standing on the rock that my brother and I used to play on at my, at my uh, parents' house that was my grandparents' house. And these guys have been um, slinging arrows and throwing lead down range for a long time together. And uh, so men, uh, step up front here and deliver the, the, the charge of the Stronger Man Creed to these men and we'll, we'll pray. And actually, you're going to do this. I'm, I'm going to head off stage. When you guys finish delivering this, would you pray for these men? and send them out. All right. Okay, this is the Stronger Man Creed. I am a soldier with a king to serve and a battle to fight. I will not go quiet into the night or let my heart be filled with fright. For all that is good and all that is right, I make good in battle with all my might. I am courage in human form. I am a vigilant protector. I am a farmer working a field to harvest a crop. No matter the challenge, I will not stop. Wherever I go, things flourish around and come up from underneath the ground because I diligently water and sow and care for things so that they grow. I get it done. I do what it takes. I am perseverance personified. I am a diligent provider. I am an athlete 
running the race to win the crown. No strain or pain will keep me down. And one day I will hear the sound, well done, good and faithful one. That alone is why I run, so I push hard to the very end. I am a visionary leader. I'm a son, known and loved. I'm a man who's free from a life of sin and misery and self-imposed slavery. Thanks to Jesus' work on Calvary, I'm a blood-bought branch of the family tree. Yes, I sing Jesus loves even me. So glory to the King of Kings. I'm a lover of the one true God. Evil will win. Good men are all gone. I often hear it said, so lend me your ear and let me be clear. Valor is not dead. So this is my life, my pledge, my code. I will walk the narrow road, pushing, striving, sweating, straining, growing, hustling, never caving to the siren song of the me-centered life. I live for one, no matter the strife that comes when fighting for good. And with all my strength, I'll answer the bell and hit with force the gates of hell. This soldier, farmer, athlete, son won't flinch in the storm no matter what comes. No matter what arrows the snake may hurl, I'll kill the dragon. I'll win the girl. And I'll make good use of all my days by spending them to proudly say, I count myself among the clan of those who follow the stronger man. So that is what my life will proclaim with all I am, all in, one name. bow your heads and pray with me. Dear God, first of all, I just want to thank you for this time we get once a month on Wednesdays. They're, they're uh, pivotal every month for me to, to recalibrate and uh, catch my bearings and see where I'm going, what's the next step for me, who do I need to talk to at school, uh, where can I improve, where do I need to improve, Lord. So I thank you for this time. I thank you for the men that have poured out hours and hours and hours of their time and their blood and their sweat and their tears to, to have this space for us, and especially recently this man card event, which has absolutely changed my life forever, and I know it's changed the lives of so many of my brothers. I thank you for that, and I pray that so many more men can experience that. I pray that one day, Lord willing, I'll be able to lead my son through that, uh, specifically that man card event, Lord. I thank you for this resource. I thank you for my dad. I thank you for my brother Levi on my left. I thank you for every single man in this room. And I pray that you would lead us out this month. In your name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.